podcast is brought to you by LMU Munich. Okay, so welcome to today's second lecture on the ADS CFT correspondence. And I hope you remember what we did on Monday. Um, <coughs> so where I gave you a brief outline what ADS CFT is, and then I introduced two major ingredients into the correspondence, which were um, ADS spaces and conformal symmetry. And uh, so now I want to explain you today in more detail uh, why the surprising relation between these two things arises. And um, okay, so let me give you a brief summary of um, what we did last time. Um, So on one hand side, we considered a conformal field theory in four dimensions. And so I claimed it was equivalent to some uh, superstring theory on ADS space. And this theory which we considered was a particular theory for which you can write down the Lagrangian. And so I just gave you the name of the theory. Um, if you don't know uh, the words which I'm writing, it doesn't matter. It's just to say it's a theory which is well defined, which has a Lagrangian which you can write down. And it's called n equals to 4 sun super young wave theory. And uh, okay, note there are two different n's. There's one curly n which is equal to 4. And there's an other n which is here and which is going to be infinite. Okay, don't confuse the two. And um, so this was claimed to be equivalent to uh, type 2b super string theory on the space ADS5 times S5. And um, Okay, so as I also explained already a little bit and will explain in more detail today, there's a particular low energy limit which is involved in this. And um, so if you take this low energy limit on this side of the correspondence, then um, what is going to happen, and I will explain this in more detail, then you become, uh, you, you get a theory which is strongly coupled. So SYM is the abbreviation for super young wave theory. And also, what happens is that the rank of the gauge group, so this n will be very large, it goes to infinity. And if you take the same limit on this side, then you get um, not uh, super string theory on this background, but you get classical supergravity on this space ADS5 times S5. Okay, and so there's a claim of equivalence both at this level, but also at this level. And mm -hmm. I'm confused a bit because uh, if in the n by n by four there are multiple properties. Yes. So they are passing through, right? Yes. So what does it mean that the four ones to be n? Uh, they get a function here, so they must be just by n. All right, okay, so, okay, I think this word low energy limit really refers to the string theory picture, which I'm about to explain to you now. Uh, I, I, okay, so maybe this was a little confusing from, so I, I don't mean a low energy limit in quantum field theory, and I mean a low energy limit in string theory, and I, I, I will explain this, so the biggest part of this lecture today will be devoted to explaining this limit. But it's a very good question, so yeah, maybe this was a little confusing, so it's, I, um, well, it's not meant to be a low energy limit in the, in the field theory. I mean, here, 
the limit, w if, in, if you consider field theory, so as you say is correct, so the beta function vanishes to all orders, so it's a conformal theory, but um, so strongly coupled means, so you have a coupling constant G young mills, and this will be very big. So you can't do normal perturbation theory. And this other limit is also very important. It means that only the planar Feynman diagrams contribute. Okay, so but what I mean exactly by low energy limit, I will explain to you now. And uh, so to really, so I mean, it's quite surprising that this works. And if we didn't know our string theory, then um, we would never have thought about um, this, this relation. And so uh, string theory enters here as a very, very powerful tool. And this I want to explain to you now. Okay, so, um, so the main message will be that this equivalence arises from considering n coincident d3 brains um, within string theory. So within the super string theory. And the, so I'm going to explain what a D3 brain is, but I think it was also already mentioned in uh, Roberto Emperan's lecture yesterday. And um, so these D3 brains have two different interpretations. And you can consider them either in the so-called open string perspective or in the so-called closed string perspective. And I explain to you these two perspectives now. Okay, so the first perspective which we will consider is the so-called open string. And uh, so in, in this per perspective, these, these three brains, they will just be three plus one dimensional hyperplanes in nine plus one dimensional space. So, so we have these three brains. So where this D stands for Dirichlet boundary conditions. So these are three plus one dimensional hyperplane in flat nine plus one dimensional space time. And the point is now that these provide boundary conditions so that if you have a set of open strings, so strings which look like this, which have uh, endpoints, so these open strings, they have charged endpoints, but if you have such a D brain, these endpoints, well, the strings can actually end on, on this hyperplane. Okay, so that's the crucial point. Okay, so let me move to the next blackboard. Okay. So um, 
Now, uh, it turns out that if you go to low energies, um, the system, okay, so I can draw you a picture. So we have, oh, okay, let me do it a little bigger. So we have these hyperplanes and there's N of them and they are supposed to be coincident. Okay, and then we have open springs which can begin and end on this hyperplane. So this is me meant so they extend into the, into the direction of the, uh, uh, into the, black the perpendicular to the blackboard. So it's man meant to be a picture in a perspective. And so we have these three plus one dimensional planes and we have these open springs beginning and ending on them. And uh, now in a low energy limit where the spring coupling uh, goes to zero and also where the inverse spring tension or the spring length is very small, then the dynamics of these open springs turns out to be described exactly by this field theory which I written down there. Okay, and so that's why it's a low energy limit. So let me write this down. So at low energies, when the spring coupling this is gs goes to zero and the inverse spring tension which is alpha prime with its equivalent to the length of the strings squared also is very small so that's why it's low energy. So then the dynamics of the open springs are just described by this particular uh, field theory. By SUN and X to four super young Mills theory. Living on the work volume of these hyperplanes. So living in these three plus one dimension which correspond to these G brains. And the point is, it turns out that the young Mills coupling constant squared will be identified with 2 pi times the spring coupling constant. Okay, so now I'll be even more precise about this limit, and especially I mentioned that this limit is very important, and because it's very closely related to the ADS CFD correspondence, it's actually called the Maldacena limit. And so let me explain what the Maldacena limit is in this picture. So if you take this particular Maldacena limit, then um, these open springs which you have here and which are tied to these D3 brains, they will be coupled from the closed springs which you can have in the 10-dimensional space surrounding these D3 brains. Okay, so we have a 10-dimensional space, then we have these hyperplanes, and we have springs attached to the hyperplane, but of course surrounding these D3 brains we can have uh, lots of other strings, in particular closed strings w which don't end on any brain. Okay? And uh, so, so if you take now this particular limit which I'm going to write down, the physics here is going to decouple from the physics there. In principle you could think of these strings interacting with each other so they can merge, but if the spring coupling is small, then this cannot happen anymore. Okay? Okay, that's complicated, so let me write down again what I just said. So, and this in introduces also this important limit, which is called after the, discover the person who discovered, the physicist who discovered ADS CFT, uh, Juan Maldacena. So, and this limit is defined in the following way. So it means that this alpha prime, which is ex equivalent to the length of the string squared, so this goes to zero. So we take these the length of these strings to be very small. 
But at the same time, we keep fixed the following ratio with a still a dimension full quantity. So this has dimension of length squared, and this could be any length. This just has dimension length, so this is a, a kind of a mass parameter. And this we keep fixed. for r any distance which has units of length. And if you do take this particular limit, then these open strings decouple from the closed strings in the 10-dimensional ten ten club space. So in this case, so the open strings decouple from the closed string excitations in the surrounding 10-dimensional club spacetime. So the low energy for the whole system, including the brains as well as the surrounding uh, space, will be NH24 super young mill plus 10 dimensional supergravity. Okay, so my, um, my closed string, since I'm taking alpha to zero, um, the string length goes to zero, and then if I take string theory and take the string length to zero, I end up with supergravity where the particles are point-like. Okay, so the particles become point-like. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now let me move to the second so now I discuss this open spring perspective on the brains, but there is also a cl so-called closed spring perspective on the brains. And I'm going to explain to you now the second perspective, and then the correspondence will arise from identifying the two pictures. Okay? So I explain to you a second perspective, and then we will identify the two. Because the physics, I mean, I'm just describing the same physical situation. I'm describing these, these three uh, brains in that space, and um, so there will be the physics should be the same, and then we will identify these two seemingly different uh, descriptions. You, okay. For any length scale which you are considering in your problem, you take this quantity u, which is defined by dividing r by alpha prime. Alpha prime is the spring length squared, okay? So this is still a dimension full quantity. You keep this fixed while you're taking alpha prime to zero. I know it's a very delicate thing to do, but um, I, I, sh I show you it will arise uh, in, in practice in a few minutes, and then we can discuss this again. I know it's a little confusing, but I'm just saying whenever you have a di dimension full parameter which has dimension of length, you take the spring length to zero, but you keep this dimension full parameters fixed which really means uh, you keep your physical observables fixed in this limit, okay? But I agree, it's, you know, it's, it seems a little strange to why should we do that, and, but it, it will be clear in five minutes. Okay, so now I explained the uh, open spring perspective, now I will explain the closed spring perspective on these brains. And actually this will be very similar to what Roberto Emperan already told you yesterday. Okay, so the second picture of, on these, these real brains is the so-called closed string perspective. Which is reliable
So, and the fact that says, says that these V-brains, in particular these V-brains these which we are considering, these are so-called solitonic solutions of supergravity. Okay, I explain what, I'm going to write some formula about what this means in a minute. So a soliton is a kind of wave packet which doesn't spread into space. Um, So these are solitonic solution of the low energy theory of superstrings, which is supergravity. Okay, so it means um, these will be very heavy objects which you have in 10 dimensional space. And if you have a very heavy object, then uh, in, in a gravity theory, it's going to curve the space around it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I, I, okay, let me write the f f formula. I mean, so, okay, they, they will be sources for the gravitational field. Okay. I, I know it's a little abstract. Let me, let me, let me go on. I write down the equation um, for the metric and then we will see how this happens. So they are sources. Okay, basically they will be solutions of Einstein's equations with a particular structure and then you, yes. Sorry? Can you say much more? I didn't hear. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Okay, you are jumping ahead. I, I, I want to explain this, but it will take another 15 minutes, so just wait. I, this is what I want to explain. <laughs> they are sources for the gravitational. Okay, I'm going to write the equation in a minute and then you can see what I mean. And they curve the surrounding space time. And it turns out that the curvature is proportional to one over the string coupling times n. So n is the number of these three brains which we put on top of each other squared. Okay, so if I say the brains have a mass, it just means they, they are objects in general relativity and they curve the space. So the curvature of the space and having a mass is somehow the same in general relativity. Okay. But in addition to having a mass, these objects also have a charge. And um, they, they, they are sources for the various fields of supergravity, not only I mean, for, for the metric and so on, but also for other fields which correspond to the charges. Um, okay, so the end. So here you see already, if my curvature is proportional to this, if I want my theory to be reliable, this should be small. So if this is small, it means GSN has to be big. And that's important because this will ensure that it also in our field theory, it will have to be big. At the moment, I explain why it has to be big, why it has to be big in gravity, but uh, since we want to identify the two pictures, it will also imply that it will be big in the field theory as well. Okay. So, so I just wanted to say, to, so these n, these three brains are masses, charge objects, sourcing the various fields of Cassini supergravity. 
and I'll give you one example in a few minutes. Okay, so now let me make this a little more concrete and uh, write an uh, equation. And in particular, I'm going to write an ansatz for solving the 10 dimensional supergravity equations, uh, which will have exactly the symmetry corresponding to these D3 brains. So, an ansatz for D3 brain solutions of the equations of motion. of type 2 g supergravity in 9 plus 1 dimensions is the following. So first you have a 10 dimensional metric which is called the S squared and it has this following form. So this is an ansatz which, which we, we will then plug into the equation of motion. Let me write it down and then I'll explain the various ingredients. So here my x coordinates are 3 plus 1 dimensional Minkowski space and the 3 plus 1 dimensional Minkowski uh, metric and it comes with this prefactor and I'll write down in one second what R is. So R, so here again we have a factor of R, H of R and then we have a Euclidean metric. So this is in 3 plus 1 dimension Minkowski uh, metric in three plus one dimension, and then this is an Euclidean metric in in the remaining six direction. And so we define R squared to be the sum of all the y's. Okay, so it's a radius var variable in, 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 in this uh, direction here. Okay, so that's the metric. And just for completeness, and also maybe for the exercises, which we can do this afternoon, um, so let me point out that, that there will also be a Dillard form and a four form. Again, so it would be essential to really understand this if we want to understand the, the, the concept, well, what follows in this lecture. But uh, nevertheless, uh, for completeness, let me write this down. So we have a Dillard form phi which satisfies this property. So phi um, is basically a constant given by this string coupling. And then we have this four form. Okay, so it's a, a differential form, which looks like this. So there's a wedge product to make it a, a differential form. Okay, so this is an ansatz for our 10 dimensional supergravity equations and now we plug this ansatz into the, into these equations, into the equations of motion from general relativity. Okay. And, okay, so again I should say so mu and mu go from zero to three and um, why this i goes from four to nine. Okay, maybe I should call this four and nine. Okay, and again, I have before I write the board, I have to time to say that um, this ansatz has a particular symmetry Uh, SO 3 comma 1, so these are um, Lorentz transform, uh, the Poincaré transformation in um, Minkowski space, and then we have an SO 6 symmetry in the remaining direction. Okay, 
So now I have to clean the board a little bit. Okay, so we're coming closer to the punchline. Um, and hopefully we should soon. Okay, I put some paper to clean my hands, but it disappeared. So <laughs> Can any, does anybody have another piece of paper? <laughs> oh, thanks a lot. Well, okay, I, I think I'll bring my hands <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Um, okay. So now we take this, this is an ansatz, and now we plug it into the 10 dimensional equation of motion, and then these uh, equations of motion will imply that H of R has a particular form. Um, and in particular, it has to be a harmonic function. I show you this. So, so the equations. motion of 10-dimensional supergravity imply that H of R is a harmonic function. Harmonic, okay, I hope you can read this. And in particular, uh, we find the following, that H of R has to be 1 plus L to the fourth over R to the fourth. Okay, so R is this radial variable which I defined above, and here we have to have a length to make it dimensionless. But actually, it will turn out that L to the fourth uh, will be of the following form. It's related again to the spring coupling, the number of brains, and then we have also alpha prime squared. So that's a very important relation here. Okay. And now uh, what we can do is to introduce spherical coordinates. So now. Uh, we write that this dy times dy is equal to dr squared plus r squared d omega phi squared. Okay, so this is just introducing spherical coordinates. And now um, we can discuss two asymptotic cases. We can discuss the ca case when r is very big and in this case when r is very small. So when r is very big, this term becomes very small, and then h is just a constant. If h is a constant, then we just have 10-dimensional flat space if I put it back up there. Then there's another limit. If r is very small, then this becomes very big, and then we for can forget the 1. And this limit is the so-called near-horizon limit, and I'm sure Roberto Emperan mentioned this yesterday already. Okay, 
So, and this will be very crucial in context of ADS CFT. Okay, again, I'm just going to write down what I just said. So there are two other important reasons. Um, so R goes to infinity and R goes to zero. For R goes to infinity, H, R, H of R goes to one and we recover ten dimensional flat space. And the other reason, the reason for R small is called the near horizon region. Okay, I come back to this near horizon region in two minutes. Okay, so remember what we did in the open string case. In the open string case, um, we considered a low energy limit where two kinds of excitations decouple from each other. We have on one hand side, we have these open strings on the D3 brains, and then we have the closed strings in the surrounding flat space. And in this limit, I said they decouple from each other. Here in this case, we will also now have two kinds of strings. We will have the strings which are in the near horizon region, and we have the strings which are in the flat region. And if we take again a low energy limit, they will again decouple from each other, okay? Okay, so again, there are both closed strings in flat space and closed strings in the near horizon region. So just remind, let me remind you, so closed strings are always associated with gravity. So the graviton is an excitation of a closed string. Okay, so when I talk about closed string, it will always have something to do with gravity. Okay, and now we can again take this Malda-Singer limit, which I already took for the flat, uh, for the open string case. So this recall, so it was alpha prime goes to zero with R over alpha prime six. Then the strings in the two regions decouple from each other. Okay. So maybe slowly you can start thinking about what ADS CFT is going to be. Okay, I, I come to it in about five, five minutes, but maybe you, you see the picture emerging already at this point. Mm -hmm. How can I have a second? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so the NXSD store theory is the theory which we get from these open strings attached to the D3 brain. And 10 dimensional supergravity is the low energy theory of closed strings in 10 dimensional flat space. So if I consider these, these three brains in flat space, then I have open strings which can begin and end on them, and I can have closed strings in the whole space surrounding them. Now if the string coupling is big, they could interact with each other. So the open string could Im, you know, eject a closed string and something like this could happen. But in the low energy limit, when the string coupling is small, 
the two kinds of strings, they cannot uh, interact with each other anymore. And so the theory is decoupled. Yes. 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 Why not? Well, so the the string coupling constant is GS. If I take GS to be small, the strings cannot interact with each other. Okay. Well, the strength of the interaction is given by GS. If I take GS to be small, I don't have any interaction. Yeah, but now it goes to zero. So then, I mean, okay, it, it, it's really uh, okay. Take it to zero. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, I think let me go on for another three minutes because then comes the punchline and then I answer all the questions because I think it's better to see the whole picture. L just keep, I'm, you know, I, I come to exactly this point and, and just very briefly, but let me, let me just tell you, you know, I'm, I'm three minutes away from saying what ADS CFT is, so maybe I should do that and then we discuss all these things. Okay, I know this limit is strange, but it, it's essential, and you will see how in just a minute. Okay, so when so when I take the Maldacena limit, and I consider this quantity, which arises here in this factor h of r then now if I insert this formula here, which is crucial, then I get 4 pi gs n alpha prime square over r to the fourth. And this I can write as 4 pi gs n alpha prime to the fourth over r to the fourth times alpha prime to the minus two. And according to the Maldacena limit, this will be a constant. But then if I take alpha prime um, to zero, this means that um, this goes to infinity. And so the whole thing becomes infinite. And so it means if we, if we take um, this R really, um, really small, uh, we actually, so we zoom into this, uh, let's say if we take alpha to be very small, then we zoom into this near horizon region. Okay, so if I take alpha to be very small, basically this one goes away from this function. So I, we zoom into the near horizon region. And in this region, we have that h of r is equal, or is almost equal to l to the fourth over r to the fourth. Okay. And in the near horizon region, so here, then the D3 brain metric becomes, okay, so now I just drop the one from the H and I plug it into the metric which is there. And then I get the following, GS squared is equal to R squared over L squared e to the mu mu, GX mu, GX mu plus L squared over R squared the R squared plus L squared the omega five squared. Okay, so I, I said this, I dropped the one and I plugged this H of this form into the metric up there. 
So now, who can tell me which space is described by this metric? Yeah, one of the, okay, excellent. So this is the metric of ABS5 times F5. Okay, so obviously we're getting closer. Now, so now I can, I can tell you what the ABS CFT correspondence is and where it comes from and I need another blackboard. Okay, sorry. Okay, so now comes to the punchline. I can tell you what ADS CFT is. And it has to do with the fact that, in, in, so we have this open string picture and we have the closed string picture. And in both cases, we consider a low energy limit. And in both cases, we have two theories which decouple from each other, okay? In the open string, we have NX to the D4, which decouples from 10 dimensional supergravity. And in the closed string picture, we have these near horizon strings which also decouple from the strings in um, 10 dimensional supergravity in flat space. Okay, so in both pictures, I have a decoupled theory of 10 dimensional supergravity in flat space. And in the one picture, I have NX to four super young mills, and the other side, I have supergravity on ADS five times S five. And now Malacena had this ingenious idea of saying, okay, if these two other theories are the same, then also the, the um, NX24 and supergravity on ADS5 uh, ADS S5 has to be the same. Okay, this was a little quick, but okay, I'm, I'm doing this slowly now again. So, but okay, so now we're really ready to write down where ADS comes from, ADS CFT comes from. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Okay, excellent question. And I'll also mention this in after. So let me write down ADS-CFT and then I'll tell you something about the various limits, what it means for the various quantities. Okay, so remember this closed string perspective which was reliable for VS and um, a lot bigger than one. So unfortunately I have to wrap this off. Remember we have these two perspectives. Yes. Yeah. Okay, that's a very good question. And okay, I agree, I'm a little brief on this point, but you can view this from a physics point of view. So you can say, if I go to R very big, very far away in flat space, and, and then I look at objects moving in the near horizon region, there's a, a huge redshift. And the redshift is so big because there's this factor H of R, which is L to the fourth over R to the fourth, and it makes a really big redshift. And so anything you see moving in this near horizon region when, when yourself you are the other uh, uh, limit, it just goes to zero energy. Okay, so there's a physical picture. Um, Okay, I, I know I'm, I'm a little brief on this point right now, but uh, okay, I'll come back to it uh, maybe at the end. And let me just write down what the ADS-CFT correspondence is now. So let me say again, I mean, to your question, if you do a really careful analysis, you can really see that they can't talk to each other anymore uh, just because of the strong warping of the space.
Okay. Now, now. Okay, so both from the open and from the closed string perspective, we have two decoupled low energy theories in the low energy limit. Okay, let me write them down. So in fact, so another answer to your question is once everything which is inside the near horizon region is somehow trapped there, it cannot escape anymore. And this we can also show. In so we have two decouples. low energy theories in the low energy limit. So for the open string perspective, so we had type to be for gravity on flat space and n equals to four super young with theory in three plus one dimension. So this was our first perspective. Then we had the second perspective which was the closed string and there again we had type to be for gravity on uh, 9 comma 1 and we had type to be super gravity on ADS5 times S5. Okay. So as you can see, this theory and that theory are the same. And then Malasena said, well, if these two are the same, these two must also be the same. Okay. So this is the same. And then so Malda said Okay, and that's how he found uh, this conjecture. Okay. Well, it's just because you look at these, these three brains and these, these three brains, they have both these pictures. It's a fact within string theory and you just use it here. Okay. Yeah. And the crucial point that uh, only this uh, conceptual result is known, but uh, to take exactly type to be yeah. the string theory and the type of these three brains yeah. and just to uh, point of two, uh, this point of view, yeah. uh, we uh, obtain uh, so one example in the examples for this afternoon is to consider M2 brains. If you do the same with not D3 but M2 brains, then you get uh, similar correspondence but for other theories. Okay. But I mean, it's a crucial point because uh, you see, I mean, it's not guaranteed that you can do this for any quantum field theory. I mean, you have to have such a brain description, otherwise it's not going to work. Okay, 
But nevertheless, you should be impressed or astonished by the fact that these two theories, which really are totally different from each other, somehow should be the same. And so there's no proof of this correspondence so far, but there's many, many good reasons why it has to be true. And the first check why um, this seems to be reasonable is that the symmetries of these two theories agree. So let me say this. So we can check this. So in this n equals to 4 theory, we know it's a conformal field theory. So in Minkowski space, it has an SO4,2 symmetry. So just the conformal symmetry we discussed last time. And then uh, it also has a so-called SU4R symmetry. So this is something which is present in supersymmetric theories. So I didn't explain where this comes from. Just um, believe me, so this supersymmetric theory has an additional global symmetry, which is SU4. And uh, SU4 can be shown to be isomorphic to SO6. OK. Now, if we look at the space ADS5 times S5, we discover it has the same bosonic symmetries. So as I discussed, it was a hyperbolic space. And in Minkowski signature, this five-dimensional anti-de-sitter space has exactly the same SO4,2 symmetry as the field theory here. And then I have this S5, but the S5 is known to have an SO6 symmetry. So I also have SO6. OK, and it agrees. So the, the theories have the same symmetries. And so that's the first check that this makes sense. OK. Mm -hmm. OK, very good. Now I explain to you the various limits uh, and various levels of the correspondence. Which, OK, very good question, because it leads to my next point. So, so since it's a conjecture, I mean, you really see the conjectural nature. I mean, you just say, OK, I have two theories, and I say, they must be the same. OK, this is, this is really a conjecture. But you can, you can formulate this uh, conjecture at various levels. I mean, so this is a good thing about conjecture. You, you can conjecture anything you like. And um, well, then you have to check, check, of course, that it makes sense. So there's different versions. Or so say, let's say different strengths of the con conjecture. So first, you can conjecture that, um, so this is the so-called strong form. So we say it holds for all values of n and gx. So as you can see from our derivation, this goes quite beyond to what I motivated to you so far. But so you just say, OK, since it works in this case, I conjecture it, con it should work for all n and for all gf. And this would mean then that this fun uh, nx24 super young lives is equivalent to type to be Super string theory um, for all GF. Uh, so, especially for a uh, large value of this coupling uh, and for all n. And also, of course, alpha prime is then also going to be different from zero. OK, so this is a very strong conjecture, but the problem with this conjecture is that you cannot test this conjecture. Because, of course, you know uh, needs to for super young list theory, but it's uh, impossible to uh, find a very well-defined realization of quantum type to be super string theory, uh, especially a strong coupling in curved space. 
if there's not, not known how to formulate the theory. So this is a very nice conjecture on one hand side, but it's not very useful because you cannot test it. Okay, but nevertheless, it's a nice conjecture. But now we want to take, again, I come back to these various limits which I've been discussing. Now if we take, there's two steps which we can do, go down. And if we go down, then we restrict the validity of the correspondence, but then we make it more accessible to tests. Okay, so we pay a price. It's not so valid so generally anymore, but we can actually test it and use it. Okay, so we trade uh, generality for practical use. So, so the first thing we can do is the so-called um, closed limit really. So, okay, I, I, I should have introduced this closed limit at some point and just for the lack of time, I'm, I'm not really doing it here, but okay, so both these limits are, which I'm going to consider are related also to this malda schlinger limit. So this means that we keep the quantity lambda, which is just this quantity which appeared in the curvature uh, of our space. And so, okay, they, I think now there must be a factor of two pi because I used another definition. I think there's a two pi here. Um, so we take this quantity fixed, but okay, it's fixed, so it doesn't necessarily have to be large and we take n equal to infinity. Then this means in the field theory we only have the planar diagrams and it means uh, on the string theory side that we go, we go to the classical limit. So basically this means that Gs becomes very small or asymptotically zero. Okay, so then in the field theory side, we have only the plan planar diagrams and on the ADS side, we have classical string theory. So it means there's no interaction between the strings. So, okay, let's set gs to zero, uh, but alpha prime is still not equal to zero, so the, the strings have still a uh, finite length, uh, but they, they can't interact with each other anymore, and so we have a, a classical string theory. Now, okay, you see this is a restriction from number one, but um, okay, so this becomes more accessible to actually doing something, and there's a whole area of research going on currently people studying um, classical string theory in this particular ADS5 transit 5 background and there's many interesting results. But this limit still implies that we only consider uh, in going to infinity. And the most useful one, but then again, we can go one step further down, is more restrictive, but again, it becomes more accessible to test. And um, so here then what we do, that's in addition, take this lambda, which is g young mu squared n to be large. And so this means that gs is equal to zero and alpha prime is equal to zero. So this means the string length is zero and we go from string theory to supergravity. So we have classical supergravity on the ADS side, but in the field theory side, so for the ADS side, we have classical supergravity, and on the conformal field theory side, we have a, a strongly coupled theory. Okay, and this is of, of course a, a further restriction, but this is the best understood uh, version of the correspondence. And here you can actually perform lots of very non-trivial tests that this makes sense. Okay, so um, so uh, you, you really, you study the, the strongly coupled field theory um, and you map it to a classical gravity theory where you can do many calculations. 
Okay, and in this third form of the correspondence, there have been many, many non-trivial tests that this actually works. And you can, um, you can calculate correlation functions and compare them in the two pictures. And uh, it's a pretty long calculation, but you can really show, I calculate, say, a three-point function in the one picture, and I calculate uh, the same three-point function in the other picture, and the results agree. I mean, so the spatial dependence agrees, but also the prefactors agree. And uh, it's quite impressive. Um, so it would be nice to show you this calculation, but usually when I do it in my lecture, which lasts a whole term, showing all the steps of the calculation takes four times 90 minutes. So unfortunately, we don't have all this time, so you have to kind of trust me that it works. But um, I, at least I want to show you, give you now for the last 20 minutes, I want to give you some brief uh, idea um, what you have to do to test this. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Okay, so the, um, you see this relation in the box up there. And uh, so it means that uh, take this equation in the box and divide it by alpha prime squared. Okay, then you get an expression. And then, and then the Malacena limit tells you you keep the left-hand side fixed in this lambda alpha limit alpha prime goes to zero. And this means that uh, GSN also lambda has to be fixed. Yeah? Okay. So yeah. Uh, it depends on the uh, Say what? So yeah, Can you just have, uh, small point, small yeah. Sorry, I I didn't quite understand what you want to ask. So there are three versions of the correspondence, whether you take G S and N to be small and big or or not. I want to see uh, which one is bigger, T or Q. Which one is equal for two? Ah okay. So the most easiest tests are done in three, and I'm going to show you how to do tests in number three. But, okay, the, the price you, you pay for number three that you are in the strongly coupled uh, field theory. Then um, it's much more difficult, but this is an active area of research that people say, okay, we understood number three now well enough, now let's try to also understand number two. So it's more complicated, but you can, there's things which you, which you can do. But today, for to the today's lecture, we will just keep to this number three. So number three is the best understood case. But is it not the same with the existing case? Uh, is it easier than number three? Yes, okay. It's true that it's more complicated because your field theory is strongly coupled. But as I'm going to show you, you can now pick some particular examples for correlation functions. And in particular, so this NX24 theory has a huge amount of symmetry, and also the beta function is zero. And then you can actually find correlation functions which are independent of the coupling. And there's some so-called non-renormalization theorems. So it means the three-point function just doesn't depend on the coupling. And if it doesn't depend on the coupling, it doesn't matter whether the coupling is big or small. And then you can compare the calculation in the two sides. It's an important point. So, so I cannot test this correspondence, in, so I'm talking of number three. If we now want to make a test of the correspondence, I want to calculate something in the one regime and something in the other regime. But the problem is one theory is strongly coupled and the other one is weakly coupled. So if I can calculate anything which somehow depends on the coupling, I'm not going to get the same results, that's clear. But there are some exceptional cases for physical observables which don't depend on the coupling. If they don't depend on the coupling, it doesn't matter whether I calculate a weak or strong coupling, and I will get the same result. Okay, that's a very important point. And so even in this, in this weakest form of the correspondence, we cannot compare any physical quantity, just the ones which don't depend on the coupling. So it's very special. I mean, you see, I mean, it's a very nice relation, but it, it is very special also. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. 
Ja. Yeah. Well, it, it doesn't matter. I mean, it, I can say I consider a strongly coupled theory, but in the strongly coupled theory, I consider something which is independent of the coupling. I mean, that's a legal thing to do. I mean, I, I mean, there's no other way you can can do a test. Okay, but let me just briefly explain to you how what you can do for the test. And I mean, another crucial thing is that. So now I explained to you that the theories are somehow related, but you can be much more precise and you can actually have a one-to-one -one map of certain observables. And if you want to do that tests, you have to use this one-to-one -one map. Okay. Okay. So there's something called the field operator map. So this is a one by one map between gauge invariant operators in the conformal field theory and fields in the supergravity theory. And um, so basically this arises from the symmetry. So you can look at representations of the symmetry group, which is the same in the two theories, and then the elements of these uh, uh, representations will be identified with each other. Okay, and another crucial point for doing the tests is, um, so we what we want to do is to calculate correlation functions for either those fields or these operators which are related to each other. So, to calculate correlation functions. Okay, so um, calculate correlation functions in and A D S five times S five. So it is convenient to work in Euclidean in the Euclidean version of the space. And so we look at a space called H, which is spanned by a variable Z naught and some vector Z, where Z naught is bigger than zero, and this is a Euclidean vector. And the metric of ADS in this Poincaré form is going to look like this. Z naught to the minus two into G Z naught squared plus G Z squared. So the boundary, remember that the space has a boundary and that's when um, Z naught equals to zero. So the boundary of the space will just be R four. Okay, 
So when I take the mod to zero, it seems that this metric diverges, but this is just a coordinate singularity. It's not a curvature singularity, so it's not so, so dramatic. And uh, so what we actually will assume is that the field theory in four dimensions will live exactly on this boundary. So this is this natural to assume that this FUN n equals to four super young width theory lives on the boundary. Of AGS five. Okay, that's pretty crucial for doing these tests. Wait, okay. So you're saying there's a duality between NX to four super young width theory and a gravity theory on ADS5. And you know that ADS5 has a boundary which has, which in this Euclidean version is just R4. And then you can just place your field theory, which, okay, the crucial point is that the symmetries agree. Okay, so the symmetries of the five dimensional space are inherited by this boundary and especially then also by the field in this boundary. It only works because the symmetries agree. Otherwise you couldn't do that, okay. So, and then um, we can look at typical operators um, which, um, which are in representations of, of this theory. So for doing the test, so we look at typical operators in simple representations. Well, simple, okay, I mean simple in, in the sense of not complicated, okay, so let me put in, uh, inverted commas. Okay, and then this field operator map in the ADS CFT correspondence conjectures that um, the elements of these representations can be mapped one to one to two supergravity fields on, in the gravity theory. Okay, and uh, on, the ADS, uh, on the ADS side what you can do, so you have these 10 dimensional fields on ADS 5 times S5, and you can do a so-called Kaluza-Klein reduction on the S5. So you expand your fields in spherical harmonics on the S5. We decompose all the fields into Kaluza Klein powers on ES5. Okay, it just means, right, so this is a 10 dimensional supergravity field, and I just write it in such a way. Okay, so these are the coordinates on ADS5, and the y's are the coordinates on the S5. And so here I have my spherical harmonics on, so.
Okay, and then you can take this ansatz and plug it into the equation of motion in 10 dimensions. Okay, so where we're heading towards here is to actually do a test of the ABS CFT correspondence. To really calculate a correlation function in the field theory and calculate a correlation function on the gravity side and then compare the two with each other. So the 10 dimensional equation of motion for such a scalar field, so this is a scalar field. And so basically if I plug this into the 10 dimensional equation of motion and it hits the spherical harmonic that will just give some eigenvalue, okay? And um, so what you discover is the following, you get the five dimensional Laplacian on ABS and this eigenvalue actually corresponds to a mass for this field, Kaluza-Klein mass. So you get this equation and it turns out that this mass is going to be given by this expression where delta is this index which we saw here. But as, as we will also see is that delta is the so-called scale dimension of phi delta. So it has something to do with the dimension of this field. Okay, and now this equation has two independent solutions and they're called the normalizable and the non-normalizable solution. Okay, what, what, what I'm heading towards is to give you a formula for the abs cft correspondence. So far, I just gave you an argument, this argument here, but we can cast this into a formula. And, and this formula is then very useful for actually performing tests of the correspondence. Okay, so, so the two independent solutions to the second order equation of motion are characterized by their asymptotics So um, basically, at the boundary, we have one solution which goes like then not to delta and another which goes um, to the z not to the four minus delta. And this is called normalizable because it just goes to zero as z not goes to zero, but this one diverges, so it's called non-normalizable. And then um, it was found that later after the original uh, paper of Malacena um, that you can identify the coefficients uh, with two different, um, uh, two different physical interpretations. So basically you can write that asymptotically when z0 goes to zero, um,
you have a web for an operator. And another term which corresponds to the source for this operator. So this is a vacuum expectation value, and this is the source. So, so the boundary value of the supergravity field phi. So by boundary value, I mean this phi bar is the source for an operator O in the dual quantum field theory. So and if you want to know which supergravity field is dual to which operator, you have to look at their symmetry properties. They have to be in the same representation of the symmetry field. So that's pretty important, and that's how you can actually test the correspondence. So now I can give you a mapping between the correlation functions in super young wave theory and the dynamics of supergravity. And so here we get this uh, important uh, formula. So basically, um, okay, uh, let me sh cut this short a little bit view of time. But um, so so let me say it's given as follows. So first, in the conformal field theory, we have a generating functional W, which depends on these couplings for all the correlators of operators of the form O delta, so this is the scaling dimension. And uh, so in the field theory, we can write the following expression. So the generating functional for these particular composite gauge invariant operators um, is given by um, the expectation value of, um, here we have to see the sources, and here see, we see the supergravity fields, <coughs> like this. Okay, so this is our generating function in the field theory. And now uh, we can write a formula for ADS, because we just identify this generating functional with the uh, classical supergravity action, okay? So we have a formula for the ADS CSP conjecture which says that this generating functional in the quantum field theory where these phi's they are the sources for the operators in this quantum field theory. So this is identified the classical supergravity action in five dimension so on ADS five times this is five. 
that, then you have to identify the boundary values. With um, okay, uh, I have to write this a little more careful. So there's a limit z mod going to zero, and uh, so here we have then the source phi of um, times z mod to the four minus delta, I think this is correct. So the point is you say, I, 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 for the correlation functions in my quantum field theory, I need a generating functional. This is this object. And now the ADS-CFT conjecture says, I identify this generating function, functional, the classical supergravity action on this space. But there is a constraint which says the boundary values, the boundary, of the ADS space of my field, these have to coincide with the sources for the dual operators. Okay, I know this was a little quick because time is running out. I'm really so, uh, sorry about this, but um, I hope you can understand this and maybe discuss this also this afternoon in the advantage class. So um, you have a supergravity theory on a space with a boundary. On this boundary, you have your quantum field theory. And in the quantum field theory, you have particular source terms for particular operators. And now you say the dynamics of the fields in, of these operators in the quantum field theory is described by this higher dimensional supergravity action with the constraint that the boundary values of the supergravity fields coincide with the sources for the operators. Okay, I'm sorry, this is long and complicated and we've been talking for over 90 minutes now, but uh, I hope you get some flavor about this. Okay, and I need one more minute, sorry, I'm almost done, for people to do the examples this afternoon. So um, the last thing I want to say is how you can actually calculate Feynman diagrams using this description. And um, what you can actually do is you can um, draw pictures of your anti de Sitter space where this is the boundary of the anti de Sitter space and this is your anti de Sitter space and now if you want to calculate say a correlation functions of three operators at the boundary okay so you consider three points which are here here and here on the boundary so this is x y and z and now you can, um, if you want to calculate the three-point functions, you, ca you have to cal consider propagation through this higher dimensional space. Okay, so, and this is a, a Feynman diagram where you have a propagator in this higher dimensional curve space and you have an interaction point here. So these interaction points are given by the kaluza klein modes and uh, these propagators here are the so-called bulk to boundary propagators. If you have more complicated Feynman diagrams like this, okay, I should say these, these diagrams are the so-called written diagrams because they were proposed by written. If you have, say, a four-point function with four points on the boundary, then you get a graph which can, for instance, look like this. So again, you have these bulk to boundary propagators. You have interaction vertices, which are given by your kaluza klein modes. Uh, this here is called a so-called bulk to bulk propagator. Uh, there's one question on the example sheet about these bulk to bulk and bulk to boundary propagators, and I was going to write them down for you on the board, but it's really running late. So maybe people who want to do this example in the example class, I will ask them the tutors to actually give you the expressions for those uh, in the example class. Okay, I'm sorry for overwhelming you with lots of things at the end, but uh, I think it's important to have seen this once and I think I hope the main message is that you understand that ADS-CFT is rather delicate, but at the same time it, it's very powerful and now we can really start calculating things for strongly coupled 
gauge theory is by mapping them to classical gravity theory. And I'll show you more examples on Saturday. Okay, thanks for your patience. And <laughs>